Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about textures and how to actually get them loaded from a file on disk into memory, into OpenGL, and ultimately rendered on screen as you see here. We're also going to be able to support not being able to load a texture. And in this case, what we've done is said, okay, we can't load the texture. We're going to load a checkerboard pattern instead, which is obviously very noticeable. And it's very clear to see that the texture couldn't be found, couldn't be loaded properly. And so we defaulted to this. So go ahead and subscribe, click the like button below, and let's get started. The first thing we're going to need is to use a library to load an image from disk. That's going to allow us to load the image into memory, which we can then pass to OpenGL in order to be able to render that texture on screen. The library that I'm going to use is STB, which I usually pronounce stub. Um, and specifically, we're going to be using stub underscore image dot age, which is going to do exactly that. We're going to give it a file path for where our image lives on disk. And in return, it's going to give us a pointer to that data. Once we have that, we can copy it into OpenGL. So go ahead and clone this, which I've already done, and I've got it here. So we're going to want to take stub underscore image dot h and the license as well. So I'll copy that over and we're going to build this into hippo. So in hippos include external, create a new folder, call this TV. And in there, we'll just copy stub image dot h and license. Now that it's there, we can go back, run cli.bat so we can call our geniseln. And then we can switch to our project. Let's reload this and we're good to get started. So the first thing we're going to need is a texture class. So in hippos, uh, source hippo graphics, we can go ahead and add a texture.h. We'll need a texture.cpp as well. We'll start with our namespace like always, and we can define our texture class here. So to start in the constructor, we should take in a const std string reference to the path of where the image lives, and then we'll need a destructor as well to clean ourselves up. For std, for std string, we need string, and we can keep track of our path within our class. Now the texture representation within OpenGL will be denoted by an integer, which refers to sort of the ID of that texture, just like we do with buffers. So let's go ahead and track that as well as a UN32 underscore T MID. And we can also track a couple of other things that stub image will to give us, which is the width in pixels of the image and the height, as well as the number of channels. So stub image will also give us a number of channels, and this could be three for an RGB texture or four for an RGBA texture, which has alpha. It could also be one or two if it has only one or two components for per pixel. Great. Now our API should expose our ID. So let's do an inline un32 underscore t get ID. Same with our path, just in case we want to get it. Maybe along with the ID, we can also ask for the width and height. And the num channels. Not sure if we'll use these, but it's fine to expose them. And just like everything else in OpenGL, you want to be able to bind and unbind the texture. And that's probably enough for now. So let's switch over to our texture.cpp. We'll include hippo graphics texture.h. And with the namespace defined, we can come back and get Visual Assist to create the method implementations for the texture methods, the ones that aren't inline and defined here. And we're ready to start. Now, the first thing we're going to need is stub image, right? And this will be the only place we use stub image, and we, we shouldn't try and use it elsewhere. We'll just abstract it all the way behind this texture class. So we need to include external stub stub image dot h. Now, if you read the documentation, they're very explicit. Uh, one and only one translation unit must define the implementation for stub image. Uh, 
with a preprocessor defined. So define stub image implementation. Again, this is just documented uh, as something that we have to do. Uh, and we must only define this once before we include it in a single translation unit. Now we're also going to need GLAD since we'll be making some OpenGL calls. Perfect. Now in the constructor, let's just set the path to whatever's passed in. And then we can also set our M width to zero, M height to zero, and our M num channels to zero. Great. And now the call that we're going to make to load this into memory is called STBI underscore load. And you'll see it takes four things, the file name itself, and then a pointer to three integers, uh, which will be used as out variables that the method will set up for us. So I pass in a reference to M width and it will fill it in for me. First, the file name will use to path.seaster, which will give it the char star representation of the file name. And then a reference to something we'll call width, and a reference to something we'll call height, and then a reference to something we'll call num channels. And for the last parameter, we can just pass in a zero. Now we'll have to define these width, height, num channels. And it's okay to not initialize these since these are going to be set for us within stubby load. Now stubby load is returning the pixel data as just a big chunk of memory. So we are going to want to track that. Now the data does come back as unsigned bytes. And the way we represent bytes in C++ is with chars. So let's have an unsigned char star. This will be our M pixels. And we can initialize that to null pointer to start. And set it here. Now that we've done that, we can check if M pixels is still null pointer. And if it is, then we know something went wrong. So here we can say hippo error, unable to load image from path and pass in the path. Else we can actually set our internal M width and height M num channels to the values that we got back. Since we know they will be correct and non-negative because you can't have negative width, height or num channels, we can just cast them over. Width, height, num channels. And now that we have the pixel data, along with the width and height, we know how large this data is and we can actually go ahead and copy it over to OpenGL. So maybe I'll just define a separate method just to do that uh, as a private method. We'll just call it uh, load texture, which will just do that for us. Switching back, we can come down and define load texture. So the last thing we'll do here is call load texture. And then we're done here. Hippo error needs to know. Hippo log. And just before we get into the load texture piece, because we are calling STBI load, we do need to free the texture, the memory as well. And there's a helper method for that as well. Stubi underscore image underscore free. And we just pass in the pixels that we got. So M pixels. And then we can just re reset M pixels to null pointer here. Great. Now to the fun part, let's load the texture into OpenGL. As always, the first thing we do is we call gen something, in this case, gen textures. We're going to gen one texture and we'll put the ID in MID. And then I need that helper. That helper's there, so I can call hippo check gel error. And then we can bind that texture into the gl texture 2D target with MID as the ID that we're binding. Perfect. Now you'll notice I'm calling load texture regardless of whether mpixels is valid or not. And the reason I'm doing this is because if stubby load couldn't load this image for whatever reason, I want to be able to provide a fallback. And in my case, I usually like those checkerboard textures that you know are obviously very incorrect and wrong and they stand out. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna do that. If the pixels are invalid, we'll just create our own pixel data with our own number of channels within height, and we'll just define it programmatically. But first, let's cover the case where stub i underscore load does successfully load an image. So if mpixels, we need to figure out a couple of things. Because 
ultimately what we're going to be calling is GLTextImage2D. And this takes a couple of things. The target we know is GLTexture2D. The level, we'll just set to zero. This is a mipmap level and you don't have to worry about it for this purpose. The internal format is the format that we are going to store the data in within OpenGL. This could be GLRGBA, it could be GLRGB, uh, obviously depending on whether we have four or three channels respectively. We pass in the width and the height, uh, we can pass in zero for the border. And then the, the format, the, so that we have the internal format, which is how we want to store the data. And then we have format. So what is the format of the data I am passing over to OpenGL? In this case, we know they are unsigned bytes. That's what the I underscore load gives us, which we're tracking as unsigned chars. So we'll pass in GL unsigned byte there. And then the actual data, the pixel data goes in. So let's just write that all out. So GL texture 2D, zero. And the internal format, so this is the, the format. So let's just go up here real quick. And uh, the formats are all stored. Anything in OpenGL is really stored as a GL enum, which we'll call data format equals zero. And then we just check if m num channels is four, then we know that data format is GL underscore RGBA. And I know sometimes it could be saved as GLBGRA or ARGB. Uh, we're just going to say, OpenGL, please store it as RGBA. That's just what we're going to decide here. And then else, if mnum channels is three, then the data format will be GL underscore RGB. And that's all I'm going to support. I'm not going to support anything with less than three channels or more than four channels. So if data format is still zero, we can uh, just do a hippo error here. And you know what, if we have something with invalid texture format, we probably still want to do that fallback that I was talking about, the checkerboard pattern. So maybe we'll do all of this out here, right? Let's calculate the data format of whatever we think we're loading. And we'll only go down here if M pixels and data format does not equal zero. So now that we have this data format, that's what we can pass in as the third parameter here. Next is the width. We have this, it's just M width and then M height. The border will pass in zero. Now for this format, again, it's the format of the data that we have loaded from stub image. And again, I'll only support the data formats I've outlined above. So this will just be data format as well. And the type, again, stub i underscore load gives us an unsigned char pointer, right? So it's an array of unsigned chars. So we'll tell OpenGL that it's a GL underscore unsigned byte. And then finally, the real data, m pixels. Using the width and the height, the NGL and send byte, data formats, all of that, it's going to figure out how much data from mpixels to copy over internally into the texture. And then we can just hippo trace. Maybe we'll just say loaded x channel texture and then the name. So we can say mnum channels and mpath dot dot cster. Okay, that's it. Pretty straightforward. Now, if it was either an invalid format or an invalid file altogether that stub I couldn't load, we're going to sort of define our own pixel data here. And this is straight, pretty straightforward. We can keep mpixels null pointer as it is because we technically did fail to load something. But instead, we can just define a, a new one called pixels here. It'll just be a float array. And we can define what our pixels are. And so our pixels could be RGB and we'll say it's RGB per pixel. And then we just start writing pixel data. So what I'm going to do is write uh, 1.f, 0.f, 1.f. This is red, green, blue, which is going to give you sort of a, a magenta. That's the first pixel. So top left pixel. Then we'll have a full white pixel. Then we'll have a magenta pixel. And then we'll have a full white pixel. Now I'm going to do the same in the second row of pixels, but I'm just going to offset it. So now it's white, then magenta, then white, then magenta. And I'll repeat that four times. So basically I'm creating a four by four pixel image where it says the first pixel is magenta, then white, magenta, white, white, magenta, white, magenta. And that's how you get that checkerboard pattern. Okay, then I'll semicolon. And now because this is the data we've defined, I know that my M width is four, 
and height is 4, and num channels is 3. And now, again, I'm just calling this with slightly different parameters. Still GL texture 2, still 0 for the level. Data format, in this case, we're not using the above. We'll just explicitly say it's GL RGB because I'm only defining three components per pixel. We can use some width and height. Still 0 here for the border. Same data here, GL underscore RGB. And this time I'm giving it floats, not unsigned bytes, because they're easier for me to sort of read and understand. So I'll just say I'm, the data I'm passing you is GL floats. And then the actual pixel data itself in call pixels. Okay, now one thing I should probably do is add these calls to the end of these OpenGL calls. And now instead of a hippo trace we successfully loaded, I can say hippo warn. Unable to load texture, defaulting to checkerboard. Great, so at this point, at the end of this else, we have something loaded into our texture, whether it's the real thing or a checkerboard pattern. And that's it, we're done. So we can just unbind the texture with GL bind texture, GL texture 2D, zero. And while we're at it, I'm just going to copy that into the unbind method and copy this into the bind method. I'll save that, and that should be enough for us to at least get some prints about whether or not we were successful in loading some images. So even though we won't see anything right away since we're not rendering them, we don't have a render command for it, let's just switch over to main.cpp and see, make sure that we can get those prints out. So I will create, let's pull in texture. And let's create a std shared pointer to a graphics texture and texture. And then the initialize just at the bottom here. Let's just say m texture equals std make shared graphics texture. And it takes the path. So let's assume we have a resources folder image.ping. Great. Let's run this. And I guess hippo app is set as my default for some reason. And by hippo app, I mean Pong. So let's just switch this over. Set a startup project, hippo editor. Let's try that again. Okay, here we go. So unable to load image from path res image.ping. Texture format not supported, num channels is zero. Unable to load texture res image ping default to the checkerboard. That's a little verbose. Um, let's just go up to texture again. So I guess this one we don't need, right? We, we're gonna we're gonna print something else below. So this one we don't need at all. We can just say if pixels does not equal null pointer, or even just if pixels, then we can just set the width, height, and num channel. So that's good. Data format it's gonna print this out. Yeah, and in, in this case it's gonna data format is gonna be zero because we set our m num channels to zero. If we're not if we're trying to load something that it can load, so maybe we'll just say if we have valid pixels. Right? If, if we're loading valid pixels, which we actually stub I underscore load worked, but it was a data format that I'm not supporting here, then we'll print this. So I think that makes sense. And then we can keep these two down here. So let's run that again, and that should be a little clearer. We should only have one error message printing right now. Perfect. Unable to load texture, res image, defaulting to checkerboard, and we're assuming that that is just working. So now we need a real render command to render this on the screen. What I'm thinking is just... We have render mesh, uh, that's really the only render command we have that actually renders. So why don't we just copy this and say render mesh textured. Render mesh textured will take a weak pointer to a mesh, a weak pointer to a texture, and a weak pointer to a shader. It'll say mesh texture is texture. We have to tell it what that is. Texture texture and I think we have to forward declare texture here. Good and then if we right click and create the implementation for this execute method which we'll put up top it's going to be very similar basically the exact same thing except it'll be render mesh textured and we'll need a texture 
So we'll bind the mesh, we'll bind the texture, and we'll bind the shader. And then at the end, we'll unbind everything. So pretty much the exact same code. We're just adding a texture bind and unbind there in the middle. Let's include texture. And that should be all we need in order to actually have this functioning. Very straightforward. This is why I like the render commands idea. It makes it really easy to just add a new way to render something. Um, now, while this is great, we don't have a couple of things still. We need a shader to actually read data from an image. And we need a way to actually store the subtexture within the image that we want to show. So the first things we should do is really just grab an image to put in here to actually render. And the image that I've chosen is my own logo image. As you can see, it's actually quite small. It's 32 by 32, but that's fine. It'll do. So I'll copy that in. Now where to put it? I'm thinking in Hippo Editor, we have this post build copy, you know, where we had our angui.ini. This is per probably the perfect place for us to have a folder called res with the image in here, it's called bro.ping. That's where the image is going to live. So now coming back here, if we go back to main.cpp, let's try to load res slash bro.ping. Now you see it's still unable to load the texture. And the reason for this is that we put our image within post build copy and then res. And if you remember from a couple videos ago, or maybe last video, when you run this from Visual Studio, it's going to run it off of this directory. So it actually can't find the resources folder. However, I don't want to put post build copy in the path because that's not gonna be the case when we actually copy this over and run it from the binary. So what we can fix this is with a symbolic link, which basically is gonna allow us to have res as a quote unquote folder within this folder, but it's actually just a link to this folder and that'll actually solve both problems. Now this is something that's only really going to be necessary on Windows, uh, simply because Visual Studio is running off of this directory, but every, everywhere else and all the other platforms, we're going to be using our CLI to just call CLI run and run it from the real binary directory. So for now, I'm just going to do that. CLI run, we should see that it pro properly loaded the image because it does exist in that path that we gave it. So this is great, but now we want to see it on screen. So in order to actually render something from the image, we do need to update our shaders. And if we look here, we see we're passing in a position per vertex, right? And that's what we defined up here. These are just vertices we're passing in and the vertex shader itself is using them. We're going to need to also pass in offsets into the image. Coming back to our image here, we've given positions per vertex in, in for our quad. And you can imagine our quad is exactly the square that you see here with our vertex positions being from negative 0.5 to 0.5. Now, what we also have to give it is uh, texture coordinates. And this is really per vertex, where in the texture do you want to sample from? Now, when we're talking about texture coordinates, we're going from zero to one, zero, zero being bottom left and one, one being top right. So we would want the top left vertex, for example, to have zero, one for the texture coordinates, which are also sometimes referred to as UVs which is an alternative name when referring to X and Y positions, but a UV specifically refers to a texture. So in this case, this bro.ping, I'm going to want to tell OpenGL what the UVs or texture coordinates are per vertex. And just like our positions, when we get to the fragment shader, it's going to interpolate between them and figure out exactly where to pull from the texture. So if I give it the correct texture coordinates, we should see bro.ping within our rect instead of the colors that we currently have. So how do we actually give it this additional information? Well, what we're currently doing is providing these vertex positions with the X, Y, and Z components into this mesh constructor. And it's actually doing the backend work to tell OpenGL that these are three dimensional vectors that define a vertex position in the first position of what the shader will receive. We do something similar with elements where it does the exact same work. It just happens to be bound to element buffer instead of array buffer. So for the purposes of this video, we'll just extend this constructor to support additional data and specifically to support texture coordinates. But worry not, we will come back and clean this up with a really nice API. So for now, let's just add some new floats. We'll call it text coords. And so starting from the first vertex, which is 0.5.5, .5, which is top right. So our texture coordinate is one, one. 
Next, 0.5, negative 0.5 is the bottom right, so it's going to be 1.f, 0.f. Basically, everything negative up here will be a 0 down here, and everything positive up here will be a 1 down here. So to finish this up, 0.f, 0.f, and then 0.f, 1.f. Perfect. And now, let's just pass this stuff in. Maybe after the dimensions for the vertex, we'll pass in a reference to text chords at 0. So now, switching to mesh, we need to support a new constructor that has a float star for vertex array, vertex count dimensions, and then a float star for what we'll call text chords. Great. And now we have a second VBO. This will be the M text chords VBO because we are going to be storing these as separate VBOs within the VAO. So now for the implementation of this constructor, we're basically going to do the exact same thing. So really, we just want to call, let's see, this is the original constructor, which defines the positions in this GL vertex to trip pointer, which tells OpenGL that the zeroth attribute is going to represent the currently bound buffer, in this case, the M position VBO, which contains our vertex position information, vertex array up here. So our elements constructor is calling into this constructor to make sure it does all that work, and then it sets up the element buffer. So we'll do the same thing. We will call, uh, in this case, we'll call the elements constructor. So vertex array, vertex count dimensions, and then element array, and then element count. And then we'll do additional work in here. And really the additional work that we need to do is going to be very similar to this. So I'm just going to copy that. This time we're not genning a vertex arrays, we're just going to rebind our v VAO. But we are genning an M text cohorts VBO because we are generating a new buffer. And this is an array buffer, so we'll copy that here. And now the data we're pushing into the buffer is still vertex count, but this time not times dimensions, which is three because there were three positions. In this case, it's times two, which again, I will just hard code here because texture coordinates are really usually in two dimensions, a U and a V. So it'll be the number of vertices times the number of dimensions per vertex, which is two, times the size of floats. That is the size in bytes of our text cohorts array, which is what we're going to pass in here as GL static draw. Perfect. And now all we need to do is say that not position zero, because that's currently bound to our position, but position one. And again, instead of dimensions, we just have two here for the UV and it's two GL floats, no offsets, no strides. Perfect. And then we just clean everything up, unbind, and we're all set. So now, calling this constructor should properly set this data, this data, and now this data as well. So now by calling this constructor, we are just defining that the attribute in position 1 is going to be two floats. And for us, that means they're going to be the texture coordinates. So switching back to our main.cpp, we're almost there. We are calling the correct constructor now. So now we need to expose those vertex positions from layout location one as a vec2 called text chords. Now, because we're not doing any sort of sprite sheets or anything like that, we can just pass these texture coordinates directly into the fragment shader, because again, we need them to be interpolated over each fragment so that the fragment shader knows where to pull that data from the texture. So we're gonna have a new out vec2. We'll just call it uh, T or maybe just UVs. So we'll also output a vec2 called uvs, and we'll just say uvs equals text chords here. So we're just pushing those through to uvs, which we will pull in as a vec2 uvs here. And now instead of the color, we'll just keep this sort of commented out for now. So instead of defining the color sort of in line here, what we actually want to do is sample a texture. And we need two things for that. One of them is a uniform. And the type is something you might not have seen before. It's a sampler 2D type. I'll call it text, like for texture. Sampler 2D is it's just an internal way for GLSL to refer to a texture that's currently bound, right? So again, if we just go back to our render command real quick, we bind our texture before we execute the draw call. This is important because the texture that is currently bound is what will be exposed here in the sampler 2D uniform. Now, there are some intricacies here where I can actually pull in multiple textures. And the way you do that is by binding a different texture to a different quote unquote slot. So each shader can actually reference multiple textures, more than one texture. For our purposes though, we only want to reference the one texture. So we'll just keep it like this. And the default value again is just going to be the currently bound image into slot zero.
So the second part that we need is just a function call. So out color will be whatever is returned from this texture call. And again, it's a GLSL specific call. And what you do is you pass in the sampler 2D, in this case, TEX, and then you pass in the UVs. So now let's just quickly recap before we try to run this. We have a texture class where it loads image from disk, gives us some pixels, and then regardless of whether that worked or not, we call it GL text image 2D with some sort of data. So that gets our texture data into OpenGL. Next, we updated our mesh to be able to support adding an additional attrib pointer to an additional VBO that ref references those texture coordinates or those UVs, which means we'll be able to reference that data in the shader. Going back to main, we've added the texture coordinate data in order to instantiate a mesh with that additional piece of information there, where our texture coordinates are mapped per vertex, just like our vertex positions up above. Then we updated our shader so that we could pull out those texture coordinates, pass them to the fragment shader, and actually reference the texture that is currently bound. And finally, we added a render command that will ensure that that texture is bound before we try to actually render this mesh. And with all those pieces in place, if we go back to main.cpp, all we really need to do now is scroll down to our render call. And instead of submitting a render mesh render command, we're going to submit a render mesh textured with the mesh, the texture, and the shader. And now if we run it, we get a black screen. Now you get bonus points if you tell me down in the comments why we get a black screen before I tell you in about three seconds. Go ahead. Okay, great. So we've actually dealt with this before. Now, when we did the frame buffer video, this happened and I had to do some debugging as well. And I made the same mistake now where I erroneously thought that there was a sensible default for the minification and magnification of a texture. Now, perhaps this was changed in a recent driver update. I have an NVIDIA graphics card. So maybe we are now forced to provide the minification and magnification filters that we want. So let's close this all out and let's do this final piece. Now, the way I want to do it in texture is not just to sort of hard code it in here, but I want to be able to define what min and mag filter you want to use. And really we have two that we are going to try and use. We're going to have linear and we're going to have nearest. And you'll actually see very clearly the difference between the two once we actually implement it. So the first thing we're going to do up here is just have a quick enum class texture filter. We'll just have nearest and linear. And now we'll just have texture filter that we can get just like everything else. Whoops, I called this a filter. We should be able to set it as well, so. And now the implementation of set texture filter. So if we just switch over to our window, I believe this is where the frame buffer was defined. No, it would, be, it would have been frame buffer.cpp. So these two, these two lines are what I'm talking about. And this is what we fixed in the frame buffer video as well, which is what caused that black screen. And you can see we defaulted to linear for the frame buffer. That's probably a good idea. We'll keep that as is. But I'm just going to take these two lines and copy them over to our texture. And uh, really what we want to do is just switch on the filter. Well, first I guess we'll set it. So M filter equals filter and then switch on M filter. If it's linear, we just want to run these two lines. And if it's nearest, we want GL underscore nearest. Now, of course, we need to actually have the texture bound before we do this. Otherwise, we might be modifying a different texture or nothing at all. So let's just go ahead and set the filter, bind the texture using MID, and then we'll switch on the filter that we have now set. If it's linear, we'll set the min and mag filters to linear and break. And if it's nearest, we'll set the min and mag filters to nearest and break. And then we unbind. So now we need a default, and again, I think default into linear is fine. We can explicitly say we want nearest if that's what we truly want. So now we'll give it a default here. So M filter, we'll just say texture filter 
linear. And just doing this is not enough though, right? We still need to make those those two calls, these two uh, GL text parameter I calls, which do work on the currently bound texture in GL texture 2D. So after we call GL text to image 2D, this is where we want to call the set fil set texture filter. So now we'll call set texture filter, and we'll just pass it M filter uh, since at this point it's still the default since load texture is a private method, and we can do that for both. Now if we run it. This should be the moment of truth where we see, uh, I guess, a checkerboard because we're running from Visual Studio. And look at this. We have what, what kind of looks like a checkerboard, but it, it looks a little weird. And this is exactly why filters are important. I have a 4x4 four four pixel texture being stretched up to half of my window width and height, which I believe is currently 800 by 600. So I'm taking a 4x4 four four image and stretching it up to 400 by 300 pixels. The texture filter, in this case, the magnification texture filter comes into play, and it, OpenGL decides how to interpolate between every pixel. Since there's only four pixels all the way across, it needs to figure out how to draw them all. And what Linear does is it interpolates linearly between the two. Obviously, this doesn't quite look like a checkerboard. I mean, I guess it could be fine. It's still pretty distinguishable, but it's very magenta. Um, and really what I want is those, those very blocky four, four pixel by four pixel textures. So instead, I guess what we'll do in this case is because text set texture filter actually does set the filter internally, uh, for the else case where we're loading our checkerboard, I'll just pass in texture filter nearest. So if we properly load an image, load it with linear, otherwise load our checkerboard with nearest. Now when we stretch the image, we should be very clearly see four pixels across, four pixels down, and these are the pixel colors that we defined programmatically in that else case. Now let's go and confirm whether we can properly load an image from disk. So we'll run cli.bat and just cli run and see what we see. Now, a couple things. The first thing you notice is that it's upside down. And that's because stub image actually loads everything with zero being at the top, whereas OpenGL does zero at the bottom. So we actually have a helper method that we can call real quick here. Before we call stub i underscore load, we'll just say stubi underscore set underscore flip vertically on load to one. And they have this because they know that depending on your back end, you might have to flip it vertically if, if your zero starts at the bottom compared to at the top. So running this obviously doesn't change anything for this case because mpixels is null pointer anyways, but I should be able now to rerun from here. And now you see it's right set up. Perfect, that's one of the problems solved. The other problem that you see is that it seems to sort of be bleeding, sort of wrapping itself from the bottom of the shoes here, it seems to be bleeding to the top. Now, again, this is an artifact of the fact that we are scaling up a 32 by 32 pixel image to 400 by 300 pixels. Again, we're trying to linearly interpolate between the two. And in this case, you can see that the pixels from the bottom are bleeding into the pixels from the top. You don't really get these sorts of artifacts with a properly high res image and, and you know or at least an image you're not scaling this greatly um, but obviously our 4x4 image had huge artifacts and our 32 by 32 has this small one here now to fix this really it's it is a pixel image it's a 32 by 32 even if i scale it up and if you know if i'm going for a pixel art style obviously this looks very blurry here it doesn't look quite like pixel art um, because it is linearly interpolating between those values. So really what I want to do is change the texture filter for this image to nearest as well, because it is very much a pixel style image. So going back to main.cpp, once we load the image down here, we can say I'm texture, that's your set texture filter to nearest. And this will be graphics. So let's rerun CLI bat. We'll build SLN and run. And now we can see a very pixelated 32 by 32 image properly scaled up to the scale that we want. Awesome. So that's it. That's textures. It's really not that difficult. It's just a little bit more OpenGL code and a little bit more vertex attribute code. Now, before we wrap up today, I do want to fix this having to run from the CLI.bat situation that we've got going on here. And really, again, I mentioned this earlier, I just want to create a sim link between a new folder, a folder down here, a link down here called res and the contents of this res folder. Now, I also want this to be a simple thing to do. Like, I don't want to have to, you could do this with right click and you think you create a new uh, shortcut or 
there's a specific way to make a, a symlink for a folder. But we can really simplify this by just writing a script to do it for us within our tools. So I'm going to go ahead and open this directory with code. And I'll just create a new tool called makelink.py. So we'll import globals. And again, the goal is to create a symlink here. So at the directory of the project, I want to create a res symlink to this folder that lives within this post build copy folder. Now that'll be the, true for every project. Like Pong will have the same situation where, where we want a symlink at Pong v1 for post build copy. And if they had a res folder, they would have a res folder there. So I guess that's one thing I'm going to basically hard code here is that we, we must have things in a res folder at the very least for the purposes of copying everything over to test, not necessarily for when we actually ship a game with this, right? But just, just because we want this to support us when we're running this through Visual Studio, it really doesn't have to be something too fancy. But we do need that project name, right? So first thing we need is to get our args. Sys to argv, and we'll need import sys, and I believe we'll need os as well. And then prj will be the project, globals.get argument value, args prj. And then we'll default to globals.project name. Perfect. Red equals zero. We'll sys.exit ret. And then, like I mentioned, this is only a Windows problem. It's only a Visual Studio problem. So if globals.wins is Windows, then we want to call into the make click command from CMD. So ret equals subprocess.call. We'll call cmd.exe with a slash c. We're running make link. We're saying we're linking a directory. And because at this point we are, we're going to be running this call out of this folder. Uh, so we're going to say res. And then we want to link res to post build copy double backslash res because we're on the Windows side. And then we'll have to set just the current working directory in order for this rest to be relative. So current working directory, we'll just set it to render, which we can define up above. Render equals the current working directory slash the project slash, right? And we'll do dot format os.get current working directory and prj, which we passed in from above. That's pretty much all it takes. So we're setting the path to this current working directory, which is going to be the root folder. And then into the PRJ folder, which is going to be Hippo Editor or Pong V1 or whatever the user passes in. And then we'll call make link with directory called res to post build copy slash slash res. And so this, the fact that it'll be called res is what allows those paths to work from within both Visual Studio and the actual binary. And then maybe just else, uh, we'll just print no sim link necessary. Okay, so if I now look at this up here where I've got post build copy res bro.ping, I should now be creating a sim link, which we should see here. If I call CLI make link, sub process is not defined, of course. Try that again. You do not have sufficient privilege. Okay. So for make link, I guess we are going to need sufficient privileges. So let's try it from here where we will right click run as administrator. And now we'll run CLI make link from here. Okay, and that worked and you saw this change over here. So now we have this res folder with bro.ping within it. Switching back, Hippo Editor now has this and you can see it is a, a link to post build copies res, which has bro.ping. And if I double click from this point, we'll get right into that folder. And you can see it looks just like a real path. And that's the point of the sim link. We're basically fooling Visual Studio at this point. Go back to Visual Studio and let's try and run it from here. And now we should no longer see a checkerboard. And there we go. Now you can see that Visual Studio does properly load bro.ping, which is perfect. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.